Uh, this will be recorded today. And if you are interested in a copy of this, uh, please uh, reach out and uh, we will get you um, a copy of this, this, this recording. This is the third installment of uh, quick uh, CMRP trainings that I've been offering. And it is uh, part of uh, the series on the, the body of knowledge within the, the CMRP. So just real quickly, get some more folks still joining here. And then I will begin to share my screen and we'll go through it. <clears throat> uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you have some questions, please put it in the chat. Um, feel free to you know, mention where you're from and uh, uh, you know, say hi. And we'll, we'll get through this and uh, hopefully have some fun doing it. Um, I've been teaching the CMRP uh, preparation course for about three years now. And it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of fun because like anything, I, I, I tend to learn from others as, as, as we kind of go through this. So as questions come up, please put them in the chat and I'll try my best to answer them as we go through at the end. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen. And just hold on, I just wanna make sure I... Got what? What we want. Like I said, this rule will be recorded today. And um, yeah, let's, we'll get started on this. This is a, um, a three-part series on, on the, this, uh, the third part on the CMRP. And as I, I go through this, uh, please ask some questions in the chat if you can. So as you get started, um, so where does evolution of this goes into is, is really about asset management. And you can talk about asset management being about the, the equipment, but it also could be about the, the people that, that help run the organization. Certainly on a, on a, on a CMRP exam, there's, there's, there's the five pillars of the body of knowledge, which is more than just uh, equipment. However, today, it's, it's a talk about equipment. And to understand where this comes from is kind of understand the evolution of this. And I, I take this, this uh, uh, visual here because I, I think it illustrates a, a good history of where we're at today in uh, maintenance and reliability. Um, just as, as kind of the, the early stages of the reactive work, which dates back to the 1940s. In, not so uh, incidentally, that's around the time where we started seeing a lot more advancements in, in the manufacturings and uh, the assemblies. So there became a need for it. Um, how often are, it was more of a, a reaction mode than a uh, proactive mode. As we got through into the 1960s and 70s, this is about the time when you know, NASA was, it was working the Apollo project. Uh, Boeing was introducing their, their, their fleet of, uh, of 747s, and they needed to have more reliable equipment. And that became what was known as uh, reliability centered maintenance. But this, this, this took into effect what was planned maintenance, scheduling, you know, overhauls, creating large systems that correlate and adding more positions that were in actually into the planning and scheduling portion of what is maintenance. We move forward in the 1980s and you know, there's, there's more advancements in the technologies. The PLCs become more prevalent. And you know, we're designing maintenance and reliability. Um, smaller companies are rising up faster. And you know, we, we, we become introduced to what is you know, failure mode and effects analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. 
And then you reach the 2000s, which, you know, we're talking about the, the internet or the internet of things, the, the industry 4.0. And we've got some things called digital twins. We've got artificial intelligence. And, you know, we've, the, the gamut is out there as far as the, where, where we've been seeing it. But there's also been that need for reliability center maintenance and also of how we're incorporating people into it, which is TPM, total productive uh, uh, maintenance. So as you go through this, that's just a little bit of history of you know, where we've seen maintenance and where it's evolving. And where it's going next is, is uh, many theories can, 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 can predict on those. So the body of knowledge, and if, if you've joined any of my classes before, I've done, uh, I, I began in the business and management uh, manufacturing process. Today is equipment reliability. And I'll define that in a moment. But you also have what is organizational leadership and work management. And you think about what the Society of Maintenance and Reliability Professionals are looking for you, future leaders to be at, is that there is a portion of equipment, but it's also tied to leadership and the people part of it. So as you take an exam, you're, you're taking that into mind is like, what is, what is a good leader set, make decisions on as far as how we're managing equipment? Because we need people to help manage that. Equipment reliability, this is the, the third pillar. It is determining the equipment capacities and processes that help select the appropriate maintenance practices that go into play on it. Now, for the exam, you don't necessarily need to know how to turn wrenches or some mathematical formulas on that other than understand the theories behind it. So this is you know, def able to define what is predictive and condition-based maintenance. How does the application of that play into effect and support the other pillars? And some of the best practices for inspections and prevention of te technologies. And you know, there's, there's several of them out there. Understanding the theories and the concept behind that is part about is about as deep as you need to go as you as you're preparing for a CMRB. The equipment reliability is broken down into, um, if I take a couple different quadrants. It's understanding what the reliability measures are. After all, you can't fix what you can't measure, and the idea is what metrics go into. Uh, measuring different levels of maintenance maturities, different analyst techniques. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that. The, what are the strategies for when you have existing equipment and how you bring in new equipment? And then what is the cost justification? Return on investments. Uh, what is the likely cycle of, of an asset and how long it can be out there before um, you know, maybe written off or it's, it's, it's slightly exceeded its, its span of life. And the, the last part is uh, implementing some of the selected plans on that. And we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit as far as what, what are industries doing that help them bring up these kind of strategies in an organization. Now, well, this, this training, I'm not able to go through all of what's going into equipment reliability, but I do, I did case some snippets that I, I didn't want to talk about today. One is understanding the theory of equipment reliability. Uh, talk about the PF curve, the bathtub curve. A little deep dive into an FMEA, understanding critical spares. And at the end, I really wanted to open up to things you need to know about the CMRP. Maybe it's a refresher, maybe things you were not aware of, but how to maybe debunk a question and leave it open for questions that you may have. So equipment reliability is, is the ability to assess predictive measures the time that a piece of equipment will correctly function, right? The reliability equipment is measured based on the time the equipment runs without failure. 
you know, understanding the machine reliability is knowledgeable to critical to the factory's performance or organizations and knowing the tools and the primary functions that can detect the monitoring manufacturing of the equipment, in part to help support the overall function of the business. So to do that is to have a strategic plan. And in maintenance and reliability is an organization's process is defining its strategy or direction and making decisions on allocating its resources to pursue equipment integration and the reliability to the process of the equipment. It can also extend to the, the mechanisms for guiding the implementing of that strategy. So a whole lot of words there, but the takeaway is what is the plan and what is, how do you maintain the equipment? If you look at a term, it's called predictive analytics. And to illustrate this, this shot here is to understand that on the first slide, I talked about a little bit about the history of asset management. And you look at a low maturity level, it's, it's to ask the question, well, something happened. What happened? And often it's, it's a reactive mode. This is called restrictive analytics. But then as organizations grow, there becomes the question of why did it happen? And then if you go further, do a root cause analysis, you know, it could be predictive analytics. And then as you go through even further, what I like to call is that you, the ability to tell the future is when you're doing a tool like a failure mode effects analysis, where you were, how do you make sure it doesn't happen if it, and what is likely when it would happen? Prescriptive analytics is using the data to determine the optimal course of action. It is understand the predetermined requirements that human decisions on making the data is available. This is often used in a predictive maintenance program. Now, I'm sharing this with you as a, as a, as a reference to understanding maturity levels within organizations. Another area to look at is some of the different analytical techniques. Now, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I'm, I'm trying to set the stage for this. The, the depth of this isn't necessarily something that would be asked upon a, a CMRP exam. However, understanding that there are different aspects of what we look at. Statistical analysis is taking the data that we have. Overall equipment effectiveness, that is, that is, a, that is a term to be familiar with on, on, on the exam. Some of the quantitative analysis, this is, this is the, the data that goes into it. Qualitative is, is understanding the, the what and the why. And then, you know, text analytics, this is actually um, probably a, a more term, new term to it, but is the uh, artificial intelligence, taking AI and incorporating it into what we have as information. Becoming familiar with the, the PF interval is, is something that uh, paves way to understanding where decisions come from in, a, in an organization that's trying to drive out waste and improve reliability. Now, for many, this is probably is something you've seen before. But being able to articulate and understand it is uh, important to understand as far as the understanding of how reliability and maintenance and decisions making are, are, are developed or are maintained. So if you look at the PF curve, it's viewed similar to an XY axis, where the X measures the Y, which is the conditions of the asset, 
And the PF curve represents the behavior of an asset before it fails. In other words, it predicts the conditions of assets based on what usually causes it to fail. The P in the PF curve refers to the potential failure. When a piece of equipment could fail based on historical data or the first point where the failure would occur. Um, for example, recording the failures on a bearing could tell you that a typical typically fails after the temperature climbs above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, conversely, the F, which refers to the asset's function failure, this is the, this could typically have what about the, the, the days that it would occur before you might see a uh, premature failure in that component. The important thing to remember is within those intervals, whether it is a day, a week, it could be hours, they will occur that you catch the failure before it occurs. The PF curve, it's, it's, it's a theory based. Um, the PF curve, it recognizes the complexity of the task, which is why it works relatively well, because it, it can be moved and shift in many different organizations. Maintenance terms rely on the PF curve to monitor the deterioration of an asset. You know, historical data of the assets failure modes need to be, they need to be analyzed, but often they fall within this, this curve. You know, the different factors that affect the PF curve, such as the equipment design, um, manual errors by those that are operating, how often is used, variability of the components and equipment parts. The PF curve is used to build a better maintenance schedule, assess risk severity, and help the overall asset life cycle. Another curve, which is coined the bathtub curve, is a description of the population of equipment or components. It's used to graphically represent the life cycle or the supposed life cycle of components. It describes the relative failure rate of an entire population of components over its lifetime. And as I share the curve, you know, it it's, consists of an infant maturity period or infant mortality period with decreasing failure rates, followed by a standard life period, also known as the useful life. Uh, with a low, relatively consistent failure rate and wear out period that determines an increase in failure rate over the life of the component. If you look at the, the bathtub curve, you can see at the, the initial, we'll call beginning, offers the highest level of failure rate. Now this can be drawn to installation problems, you know, just incorrect components, um, other things that could be affected by human error. But as the theory states, its level of failure as it's used often drops until it starts reaching the end of life and its rate begins to increase. And it's no big surprise. It's often due to components that start to wear. And what you want to understand is that in a bathtub curve, often where when you're applying predictive maintenance techniques, it can be seen as a less of a curve and a more drawn out process when done properly. As I said, you know, losses during infant mortality are not desirable and often caused by defects or blunders. These can include design faults, errors in assemblies, materials, and or it was not operated to its intended use. These typical life failures or random causes stress exceeding strength of what was divine for. However, many failures are often regarded as normal life features. 
the wear out is due to fatigue or depletion of materials. You think about the importance of knowing that the equipment's useful life is limited to its short lived components. It's only as strong as its weakest link. An equipment manufacturer will normally ensure that all specified materials are adequate to the function through the intended product life. It's often rare that all the information about the product's short-term and long-term failures play into account. But the idea is that the bathtub curve is a model of the population of, of, of many components. And the takeaway is it's, it's, the curve is the mortality and increasing failure over time. Another part about equipment reliability is understanding that you have spare parts management. Managing spare parts usually generates a spirited discussion especially when critical ones are, aren't on the shelf and often would be needed. Sometimes the parts have been consumed or not replaced, or perhaps it wasn't set up to be stocked in the first place. Um, it's even more possible that parts were previously set up on the shelf, but no one longer stocked it because someone removed it from inventory. These are a lot of things that happen. The takeaway from understanding a critical spares strategy is one is, is how they're set up. In best case scenario, a reliability evaluation using a failure mode effects analysis or a failure mode effects and cause analysis would be used to identify the spare parts required for each of the machines. However, this can be relatively long and detailed process that is part of the future discussion. But without performing a full-blown failure mode effects cause and analysis, we can some basic guidelines to help perform quick analysis doing that. Jumping to what an FMEA is. It's a powerful tool and something to become familiar with, particularly for a CMRP exam. And if you chunk it up, it's based on a couple different theories. Severity, so if something breaks, how bad could it be? Occurrences, how likely is it going to occur? And detection, how easy is it to determine if it's approaching failure or unforeseen uh, causes or matters that are negative to the organization. And it's built on relatively three inputs that uh, determine a risk priority number. Now, these are guidelines. They're guidelines because each organization can determine them, should determine them on their own. And the way to understand this is that, is to understand what the severity is defined by your organization. Uh, how serious is it if this event were to, to happen? Could it shut down a assembly line? Could it shut down a unit? Could someone be seriously injured? The occurrence is, is the likelihood that would, that would happen. Could it happen once a year, once a week? Organizations have to define that. And the detection is, and this really kind of moves into the countermeasures of it, but it's asking how easy is it to identify it if it were to happen? And it often leads to a very healthy conversation of, well, what do you think we could do to, to, to reduce it? Or should we reduce it? That's where that risk priority number takes weight into 
helping determine it. It takes something that's subjective and makes it objective that they that an organization determine where they need to put their focuses to. Think about two different kinds of inputs on it. You got your design, which is being done in the early stages. And then you've got your process, which is often their, their risk priority numbers can be used in similar aspects of it. But the reason why you'd be doing it often carries different impact. Um, in this example, customer requirements, they fail them out, just say you need to do it. You know, automotive aircraft, they do re request that. And uh, uh, they are probably lead, lead the way on the due diligence in uh, FMEA. But also quality. And often it's, 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 it's a great exercise as far as risk assessments. In a process, now this is kind of where my background would come into, is you know, we're, we're, we're doing it because we want to reduce failure and increase liability. Could be process flow charts, understand the sequence of events, the data that's being pulled into it, um, the different processing tools that can be applied, or the idea of, of a pokey oak is trying to make it uh, uh, foolproof or make it, uh, I don't like to say we're um, ignorant proof, but it's uh, re removing the human portion that air could be involved into it. And I talked about this. FMEA can be applied into an in introduction to a new process, reviewing the existing process. And the design is, you know, if there's a design of uh, new parts, assemblies, uh, or the existence of what, what, what's currently out there. Understanding its use for its application into maintenance reliability is, is understanding it, 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 it's, it's a powerful tool that I say, like it's, it's got the capability to tell the future. And, you know, in reality, if you're doing a good FMEA, root cause analysis doesn't necessarily have as much impact or need because you've already identified a lot of problems in, in, a, in a future state. And their tools, they you know, generate process improvements, um, eliminate what the occurrences can be at. But understanding failure mode, which is part of both the occurrences and the severity of it. And this is the way the components, products, or process could fail. So if you're thinking about you're doing an FMEA, it's also deep diving into it in the, into a component standpoint. And often they can be built, broken out into what is internally and externally. Because at the end of it, it's about building reliability and understanding that you know, your suppliers could impact the failure of components and drive down reliability. Your warehouse, it can be inside and outside organizations. So they both need to be evaluated. And they should be done earlier than when uh, uh, the likelihood of change is occurring. Design a process. And what you see here is often, it's a team approach to it. Involving more than just one individual, but a collaboration of multiple different resources, subject matter experts that can pave the way and really open up a healthy conversation on it.
your end goal is getting a risk priority number. But beyond that, it's also one, determining the process inputs to go after. Determine the failure modes, identify the potential causes, have a list that extends on it. And then you're creating that risk priority number. And then as a group determining, well, what type of risks from this risk priority number, how much do we want to chew up on this? How, about how far do, deep do we want to go? And then it's creating action plans from. You know, it's not uncommon for a storeroom to expect that there should be at least one of everything out there. But the reality is we can't have that. So linking critical spares and FMEA is often a, a correlation. And understanding that as you're building it, there's also a cost justification to it. And it's assessing risk. And we're not gonna talk about risk management today, but there's a correlation between it and that balancing act that's constantly organizations are trying to determine. Often there's a complex process available to determine the failure likelihood of components. Talked about the FMEA. A more straightforward approach is to review each inventory item and decide whether it's, its failure mode is easy to detect or readily observable to perform its maintenance. And if it's more detectable, it's likely more to be able to be inspected. And each scenario is to consider whether part is a long-term or short-term objective for the organization. Different strategies are out there. And if, if we're going down the flow chart of of driving equipment reliability. It's also understanding the way to organize critical spares. And FME, or the CMRP is often determined in ABC, which is you got your A's, which often represent 50% um, you know, of your total inventory as far as cost, but is only used about 10% of, uh, of your actual usage year store. Um, they are defined by your organization, but determining them is, is part of understanding that they are critical and they have a, they have a value um, and assessing the risks of holding them because they can have um, a good financial impact if you're having to store these extra spares versus building out plans on corrective actions if the event were to occur. Understand what is the cost of failure. Your Bs are, you know, they, they represent about 30% of your inventory and about 30% of your usages. And your Cs is your high volume or your high, high turnovers, um, only about 20% of your inventory levels. Different strategies, you know, category A, is you know less than you know half a turn a year, meaning they could pull from there. These now these this isn't the the golden rule, but it is considered a best practice often. One or two turns a year, and then C's you know it's just it's just multiple things that can come in in or out throughout it. So I went through just a couple of the areas of equipment reliability. But what I wanted to do is just kind of set the framework on it because there's, there's a couple, several more steps that go into understanding that within an organization, 
the CMRP, the body of knowledge has the, these five pillars. And they're called pillars because they need to support each other on the different aspects of it. I didn't have enough time to go through the whole uh, exam, but what I did want to do is just give you some snippets on it. Now, as you're preparing for it, it's about understanding and envisioning the finish. You know, plan your study regularly. You think about in the weeks or months ahead for the, for the big day. Uh, create a study center. Now, if you're like me, I haven't, uh, I hadn't been to school in several years, so I had to retrain myself on how to study and creating good study habits. Share your knowledge with others. And then, you know, you know seek support. Um, I'm going to talk about the end of this that uh, we'll be offering a, a virtual event in July. It's a four day, but getting the support from your managers at the importance of having a plan of action to, to pass it on your first time. So how do you know when you're ready? Well, one, you've registered through the CMRP and you'll get a downloaded body of knowledge, fifth edition. There's a lot of PDF pages in it. Some of them are, are, are duplicated on it, but it, it gives you a, a glimpse on some of the things that the CMRP or SMRP is looking for you to want to have that knowledge to say you're a certified liability professional. Often you can go to the CMRP website and there are some webinars out there, um, but there's also training materials that you can get um, that are out there. I, you know, I, there's a couple of books that, that I used, and I've also uh, have a couple of books that I've published out there that are particularly are aimed at the CMRP. There's also, you know, protect yourself with the practicing and taking simulators. Put yourself in the scenario of, of, a, of a test. You know, think about we in most things in society, we practice it before we do it. And having that mindset going into a standardized testing mode can often give you benefits because you already know how to dissect a question. And I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit about how you can go through and help you determine what is false question versus correct question. Um, some other takeaways on this, you know, the, the CMRP is available to any maintenance reliability professional, regardless of education, background, or work experience. However, I will say those in the industry do have a little bit of an advantage because, you know, th this is, this is common knowledge for them. Most, most well-run organizations follow a lot of these guidelines, especially in the, the metrics, leadership, and having a work management plan that's in place. The different fees, um, you know, you, you can elect to become a, a member, which I encourage everyone to do. And uh, um, it has its benefits as far as it, the ability to network and learn what the continually best practices are out there. So I call this examining the exam. And these are built on facts that are non-debatable about, about the, the exam. So these are kind of some, some, some nuggets or some takeaways on it as you, as you look to prepare and take the exam. There's 110 questions, A, B, C, and D. It's built on a balance of the five pillars. You know, each test is two and a half hours long and you get a 10 minute break in between the halfway point. Uh, also, most acronyms are called out. So you would need to remember all the acronyms. 
it needs to be completed at a test center. There's no complex equations. And uh, you're not allowed to have any pen or paper. The test taker has on average 82 seconds per question. And you think about the average reading time for each question is about 11 seconds. And this is based on the, the examples that they have shared out there. So I like this one. This is, I put this together. It's, it's how to debunk a question. Let me get these up here. So I can... Read more than once, you, you have the time. Um, and think about how the CMRP would want you to answer. This may not be how you have done in the past, but you're not answering for that. You're asking how CMRP or best practices that have been seen in the industry. Certainly remove the wrong answers initially. Don't let them be part of the confusion as you're trying to look for the best answer. Look for strong language and remove. Things where there's a must, a will, absolute, they are often meant to drive uncertainty. And while in life there often isn't certainty and everything. So keep that in mind. Remark and re review at the end and look between the two longest answers. One, this may emphasize added thought or it may be a distractor. Correct answers often have verbs of the same tense and have nouns or verbs that, that agree with each other. And overall, try to go with your first choice. It's often often the best. And this is a bit of a myth, but you know, in computerized testing, often many years ago, it was thought that C was often a good choice. Now, as somebody who's, who's built simulators, they are automatically computerized and regenerated. So the idea that it's going to be C is it's only a one in four chance. So try to pick your best chance, that best option. Now, I went through this pretty fast and uh, I do wanna take some time if there's some questions at the end, but if you wanna learn more and are interested to do it, uh, we'll be hosting a four day CMRP uh, prep training. This is a virtual and uh, up to the, 16th of June, um, it's marked down about 60% off price. It's normally a, a, a $1,500 class. It's being charged just under $600 up to the, the, the 16th of, of June. So if you're interested. But what you get out of this is one, you receive all the materials, access to test simulator, um, you'll learn about maintenance, reliability, best practices, and also how to create your own maintenance, reliability, improvement plan that you can walk away with to your management team on saying that not only did I become certified on this, taking this training, but I've, I've learned how to create an action plan that can help drive the results into this. Um, So that's, that's, that's about a, as much as I can go into as car reliability. Um, I'm glad for everyone that was able to get on the call today. Um, I'm gonna check the chat here, see if we have some questions. And then uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll set you on your way. So this one question is asked, what is the, expected outcome of certification of CMRP in terms of career opportunities. Um, and this is, uh, is from India. Is there support for Indians to get jobs in the US with visa sponsorship? I, I you know, it, that depends on 
organization to organization. However, the idea around the CMRP is that you instantly have a proven knowledge that you understand the co concepts that go into driving maintenance and reliability. So having a certification gives you that little bit of, of an edge that you are familiar with best practices. Um, it also gives opportunity as far as networking because you'll be access to uh, thousands of other individuals that have CMRP. Uh, right now, there's about 7,000 members that belong uh, primarily in the North America, but they are uh, gaining headway throughout uh, the globe. And it's, 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 it's a good practice and, 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 and offers knowledge into what is, what is, what is current and future states of, of maintenance and reliability driven on. Good question. Uh, what is the next exam scheduled for? Um, I don't know if, the, is, it, is this a question regarding um, this training or actually scheduling for the CMRP? To answer both, uh, the CMRP can be scheduled really any time that uh, you see fit. It's through Pearson and it's, it, well, it's Pearson uh, uh, test centers. There are thousands of them all over. And uh, um, it is good to know that if you were not able to pass on your first chance, they do initiate a six month waiting period before you can take your next exam. For this next training, I have not scheduled it at this point. Um, it will be on organizational leadership. Uh, right now, it's just kind of opening up to where my schedule fits at this point. Uh, but I encourage you that if you're interested, I have published the other two, and this will be the third installment of those trainings. And also, if uh, you, you can scan this QR code, and it could lead you to where um, my different books on maintenance reliability and the CMRP can be found at, in addition to the, the four-day training that, that I have coming up uh, next month. Okay, so those are some great questions, and I hope you had a chance to um, scan the QR code if you haven't. Um, if not, um, you can reach me out on, on LinkedIn, and I can, uh, I can guide you in the direction that that you might seem fit. If, uh, if you're looking for more information to uh, get possibly a, a company sponsorship on a, on a group trainings, um, I'm open for that also. But anyway, it was great having uh, uh, an audience that was eager into taking the CMRP. And for those of you who have that are signed up to take it, uh, best of luck, best of luck. Please share. Uh, once you complete it and uh, um, you know, let's network out there, become a CMRP member. And um, I hope to see you out there. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop the recording. If you're interested in a copy of it, please reach out. And uh, again, thanks for, thanks for joining.